Is that? So might as well test it out while we can. Good evening. <laughs> Hi. Can you guys hear me all right? Yep. Okay. Yes, can you hear me? Yep, sure can. Hey, David, did you get my uh, emails uh, in response to yours about the assignment? No, I did not. Um, um, I don't know when you posted them, but I've been checking it all day. But for the last two or three hours, I've been working on other assignments. So during that span, I haven't checked them. Oh, okay. Yeah, I thought I, I thought you sent me emails last week that I responded to a few days ago, but I just wanted to um, – I graded uh, – a lot of the assignments from the last two to three weeks. So if uh, your questions are about those, uh, you might just want to look over the feedback I gave you on those and then you can uh, you know, get in contact me with yeah, me. Yeah, I, I emailed you, um, I think it was yesterday. Um, I couldn't figure out problem four. So I emailed you and then I also left you a voicemail on your 360 number. Uh huh. Okay. And like I said, um, I I uh, didn't see anything up until two, three hours ago because I've been working on other huge, tremendous assignments that I have. So I haven't viewed them in the last two, three hours. Okay. All right. Well, if we need to, you know, work on something, just let me know after class, you know, after you get a chance to look over the assignments that I did grade. Because if I recall correctly, the assignments that you turned in for the time value money, uh, and for the financial ratios, we're all pretty good. But take a look at those, and if you have any questions, um, then we can, uh, I can get back to you or we can have a Zoom session if that works for you. <clears throat> well, I hope you get a few more folks in tonight. Um, I've been grading a lot today, so if you guys want to log into Canvas and uh, look, you should have, if you had assignments turned in or the test from last week, um, those are all graded and uh, have feedback on those. So definitely look those over uh, for the feedback, and if you have any questions, uh, just get in contact with me. I'll give folks a few more minutes to arrive and then uh, We'll get started since we only have this week and next week, and then winter quarter is done, surprisingly. Mr. Zawaski? Yes. I am looking under my grades on Canvas and for business legal forms, uh, check a few questions, Billingham's Herald's financial assignment. Right. And problems. Three, three through three, four. Yeah. Yeah, those I, those I haven't graded yet. So I okay. From the most recent assignments that you guys submitted, basically the time value money assignments and the financials, and then I work backwards. So I'm um, yeah. Oh. The next, next thing on my list is those uh, chapter three um, problems, and I should have all of that done by tomorrow. Is my goal to have all the grading caught up on all the grading by that time? Oh, uh, sir. Yeah. Um. Now that you mentioned it, the time value money was due at five. And I, like I stated just a few minutes ago, that I had a problem with question four. I had the assignment complete, except with question four, 
mm-hmm. or we um, under payment we put in one hundred dollars, mm-hmm. and I couldn't figure out how to make that account for in in PV. I know that I'm probably one click away, but I should have turned that on assignment in and just forgotten that question. That's what I was planning on doing, but I forgot all together to turn it in. But so like said, it is complete except for that second question on question four, because I cannot figure out how to in the payment section of the one hundred dollar mm-hmm. annuity coupon. Right. How to make that PV account for that. Yeah, no, that that's not a PV. That that uh, variable is a PMT. That's a payment. Whenever something happens, yeah, I put it in. I put it under payment. Uh huh. But then, isn't it supposed to reflect in the PV? Um, it should give you the same answer that you got for the first part. Basically, you leave all the variables in there from the first part. I did. Yes. Okay, and then you just add uh, a positive one hundred in PMT. And uh, that should change your present value for that oh. question. Yeah, I don't want to on it. update it. I clicked on it and it wouldn't do nothing. It, when it did that, it came up with zero and I knew that was wrong. So hmm. I need to put a plus before the 100? No, no, no. You, don't, you shouldn't. No, just make sure it's a positive 100. So if you put in 100, it will just be recognized as positive. Um, and that should, if you leave all the other... Um, variables the same from the first part of that question, then that should also update your present value answer and give you a new present value based on that. I tried clicking on several different things, trying everything by basically experimenting, but I couldn't get the present value to change after putting in the $100 coupon in the payment section, it wouldn't do anything. Well, let's see here. Um, How are we doing on the, I watched a video. Could you push and the cord before answering the question, please? What's that? Could you hit record before um, answering the question? Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's recording. Too. It okay. records as soon as we start. So, okay, yeah. thanks. Um, yeah, David, let's just, uh, we can do that real quick here. I'll just show you how I would do that. Um, and then if you have other problems, you can email me. And we can figure it out. Yeah. Um, but let's see. So this question has to do with number four. U.S. government is selling ten-year bond that will pay ten thousand at maturity. You're seeking at least two and a half percent. What is the maximum you would be willing to pay today for this bond? So yeah, we are going to be looking for a present value here. So if I were to go up here, I'll do this all here. We're looking for at least a rate of two and a half percent a year. I put two and a half there, it rounds up, which I don't really want it to do. Um, 10 years, so the number of time periods is 10. The future value, they're gonna pay you 10,000 bucks, like that. So those are the three, for the first part of the question, then those are the three um, variables that we're working with. So I'm just gonna do this over here. We just go equals PV, and then we put rate, comma, ember, comma, payment. Now see, yeah, and so you need to click the payment space, and if it's zero, then it's not gonna do any, or it's not gonna, it's gonna assume it's zero. Yeah, I entered 100 in there. Yeah, so I'm just doing the first part. So I'm not gonna put the 100 in this time. So once I have all the cells highlighted, then, gives me an answer, it's too big for my row of 78.11.98, that's that's for the first part. Now, since I selected that payment cell already, if I just put 100 in here, it should change that 78.11 to 86.87.19. Okay, I have that all wrong. I have all the things the same as you have entered in in all the cells, except that the rate, when I put in 2.5, it kept changing to to 3%. Yeah. So you just have to change that up here by increasing the decimal here. You can select a cell and it will increase the number of decimals it shows. So, but if you put 2.5 in there, it's still going to use 2.5. Um, so. Yeah. When I entered 2.5 and then I go to the edit cells, it changes it to 
Right. That's because you don't have enough decimal places set up. So that's where you increase the number number of decimal places here. It's still going to calculate on two and a half. It's just going to show you three because you only you don't have it set up for enough decimal places. But why don't you um, see if you can do that again from the start, and then you know in the same way I did it, just do the three variables first, get the answer for the first part of the question, and then put in your hundred for payment and see if it changes the cell that you have the the PV formula in. And if it doesn't, then why don't you contact me and we can you know, go through it together. All right. All right. Well, I don't know where everyone else is, but we can get started since it's about 10 after now. Um, so I was telling folks who logged in earlier, um, I've got uh, grading done for the basically last two weeks, not the things that were due tonight, but the previous two weeks. So the test uh, has been graded and, and uh, feedback and several of the assignments through chapter four. So um, this week, I'd encourage you to, to, to look at that actually in the next day or so. I'd encourage you to look at those assignments and the feedback that I gave. And if you have any questions, then email me um, and I can give you some uh, help on understanding what parts of those questions you got wrong. Uh, and uh, just one second here. Okay. Um, so look at the feedback on those uh, assignments that I've graded. The other assignments, uh, I think chapters two and three, which I still haven't graded, I'm going to grade tomorrow. So by tomorrow night, um, you should have all the assignments graded uh, that were due up until tonight. Um, because this week is the second to last week. Basically, next week is our last class, right? And so uh, I want to make sure that you have an opportunity to look at those and answer or ask any questions you might have um, about those assignments and certainly about the test. And I sent uh, a number of you uh, an email earlier this afternoon who didn't submit a test number one uh, assignment that was due last week, March 9th. So check your email um, if you haven't, and there will be an opportunity uh, for you, to, one more chance basically to make that up. So, um, so check your email, especially if you didn't submit uh, a test last week. And then since last week, or, or next week, excuse me, is the last week of the quarter, um, it'll also be obviously the last time you can turn in late assignments from weeks five through seven. Um, so if you haven't turned in some of those financial calculation assignments or, or time value money assignments, I highly encourage you to do them before next Tuesday, one, so you get credit. They're basically due by the time we start class next Tuesday. Uh, but the second more important reason is because it's an opportunity to practice what you're then going to be doing on the test. Because the test, there'll be an in-class portion of the test next week and an out-of-class portion. And the in-class will have a lot of calculations from chapter four and chapter five, the financial calculations uh, on financial statements, and then calculations, time value money calculations from chapter five. So do the homework before the test next week, uh, and then I'll be able to, again, uh, give you some feedback. I'll, I'll grade them as they come in over the weekend or in the next few days, and uh, give you feedback on those so that you have uh, hopefully some good information heading into the test next week. So. <clears throat> um, so that's sort of the plan um, for next week is we'll take, we'll have an hour of regular, regular class um, from uh, five to six, and then from six to seven will be the in-class portion of the test. So there's just a few more concepts I wanna cover um, next week. Um, ones that you won't be tested on, they won't be included in the test, but it's information I think it's important for you to know. So I wanted to squeeze it in as much as I could. Yeah, I also noticed that I have like a regular calculator and when I, I use it on the side, but I get wrong figure with that it has to be a financial calculator. So um, Excel is a lot better than any calculator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I definitely recommend using Excel. I mean, it's one of the skills I want you to have coming out of this class is to be able to 
be comfortable doing calculations in Excel of all sorts of you know, kinds. The, um, the use of financial calculators, honestly, since Excel came out and they really developed some of these functions that you used to use financial calculators for, I don't see anybody using uh, financial calculators. It's pretty much all done in Excel or some sort of spreadsheet format. Yeah, I was just using a, a regular calculator and like I said, my figures are so much different. Yeah. So, so basically, right, yeah, that won't do the kind of math we need to do. It doesn't. Um, so tonight what we're going to do, so last week we worked on the first five functions in Chapter 5, Time Value Money Calculations. Um, the, let me show my screen here. So we did future value calculations, present value calculations, rate, number of time periods, and payment. Um, and if you look back on last week's both video um, and in week number seven notes, there are solutions to the ones that we worked on in class. So if you have any questions, you can look at the Excel spreadsheets uh, and have the answers for the in-class portion, at least, um, of those uh, functions. And tonight we're going to work, the last function we didn't get to last week was, is called uh, the internal rate of return, or in uh, Excel, IRR. So what I'm going to do first is uh, go through one example of that, and I'm actually going to use uh, the example from, that we didn't get to in class last week. Um, and work through that. So if you want to, what I'd suggest is one, open up Excel uh, to this, you know, open up the blank TVM worksheet so that you have this in front of you while I'm doing this. And again, I really encourage you to actually work along with me um, so that you can see how it uh, works in Excel. Um, and I'll do that example um, from last week for internal rate of return. And then hopefully we'll, we, yeah, we should have time. I want to give you guys more opportunities to do a few more extra time value money exercises during class. So um, I'll have a few more exercises that we can work on. And then the last part of class after break, we're gonna cover some information out of chapter six, uh, which has to do with interest rates. So that's the plan for the evening. <clears throat> Does anybody have any other questions before we get started here? Um, I tried calling you and emailing you. Mm -hmm. What's the best phone number to get a hold of you at? Uh, let me let me text that to you, or I'll chat it to you. How about that? Because Thank you. I, yeah, my phone is situation at the college has changed. So okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's see. Yeah. So these are the exercises that we worked on in class last week. Um, and we worked through one through five, and we didn't do this last one, which was the internal rate of return um, problem. And the internal rate of return is a really great way to measure the potential profitability of a project or an investment. Because what it does is it takes your initial investment and then it takes all the returns that you expect to get from that investment in the future years and it will give you uh, basically an average annual rate of return. We, we've been doing, we worked a little bit with um, the interest rate function in Excel and that works well when you have things like bonds or certificate of deposits where you're earning either a certain interest rate or you're certain earning the same amount of money each year, year after year. So if you have a $100 um, coupon for your uh, bond that you get paid $100 a year and that happens for 10 years until it matures, then you can use the interest rate to do that because it's the $100 is the same every year. But the problem becomes, or it gets more complicated, when you're anticipating that your, your profits, basically, are going to be um, different in the coming years. So if you look at, so this is uh, an example of, of projects that wouldn't have just a straight line return for the number of years of the project. Um, and the examples here are just a fish processing facility and 
and expansion of logging. <clears throat> and you can see that in the narrative up here, it says that the fish processing facility costs two and a half million. The logging, expansion of logging operations would cost a, a million and a half. So first of all, we're dealing with two different initial investments, right? So that makes it a little more hard to compare. The tribe can only do one of these two projects and it has to decide. So you're starting with two different investments and then if you look at these numbers down here in the spreadsheet, these basically are the returns from each of those projects. So fish processing starts out at 500,000, 600, 700, and it moves each year based on what the projections of, of the business are gonna be. So it makes a little less money at the beginning, more in the middle and less at the end as the equipment starts to, to, to wear down and need to be replaced. Um, the logging expansion starts smaller and just keeps increasing, at least through the six year period we see here. So we need a tool that will allow us to take all of these things into account and the different amounts of money that they're earning in the different years. So that's what IRR or internal rate of return does. It should break everything back down to one average rate of return. And so I'm gonna show you how this works. I'm just gonna copy this over here. Okay. So basically this is the information for the problem here that I took from the other. Um, we have fish processing, I'm just gonna, I like these. And then we have logging are the two projects. Okay, so the first row, and this always has to be at the top uh, of your uh, entries for the IRR. The first row is what it's gonna cost you to make, to invest in the project. So, and again, um, Investments are, uh, in this case, investments you should think of money moving away from you or moving away from the entity that's uh, investing. So it's, it's a negative because the movie is, the, or excuse me, the investment is going away and in return what you get back are these yearly cash flow returns of 500, 600,000. So those are positives. So you have to make sure your investment is negative and all your returns are positive for this to work correctly. So if we go back to the problem here, it says cost of the fish processing facility is two and a half million. So that's gonna, I'm gonna put negative two and a half million there as the initial investment for fish processing. And then I'm gonna type in all of these returns in the positive. And you have to start from the, from the current year and move forward uh, for this to work because a dollar today is worth more than a dollar five years from now, right? Based on, this is the whole concept of time value of money. Uh, money uh, is worth less in the future due to inflation. And so we need to make sure we get these numbers in the correct order. So I'm just gonna start from the top with 500,000 and I will, uh, let me get all the years in here first so it looks the same. Okay, there are the years. Sir? Yes. Can you enlarge that? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, whoops, let's try that. Okay, um, so the first year of the fish processing is 500,000. That's just a positive 500,000. Second year is 600,000. Third year is 700,000. All I'm doing is copying the information from the table into my IRR function here. Uh, 2019 is 700,000. 2020 is 600,000. And 2021 is 600,000, but not percent. Okay. Oops. All right. So those are the returns, and this is the initial investment. Assuming you have these in the correct order, all you have to do now is go down, I usually do it right below it, and I type in equal IRR, so that's the function we're using, and then hit your left bracket. And now all it says is values. So you need to, to select the values, you need to start at your investment, and then just drag down and include 
both the initial investment and then all the future returns. So I just essentially selected this, held down my mouse button, and now I have all of these selected, and I can just hit enter. You don't have to put an end bracket in there. And it says 12%. We'll make this into two decimal places, 12.17%. So what this means is that based on this $2.5 million investment, if these were the cash flows or the return on that, on average, they would be earning 12.17% a year on this particular investment. Okay. So that's what IRR gives. It's, it's not that you're making 12.17% in 2016 and 2017 and 2018, because you're earning slightly different based on these numbers. But on the whole, from the time of the initial investment through 2021, you're going to average 12.17%. So that's one number that you can use to judge a, pro uh, a project, right? Is how much money on, uh, or what percentage return on average are you going to be making on that project? So if the council wants to compare that with the expansion of logging, then you need to do an IRR function for the logging. And you do that the same way, except the numbers are a little different, right? Because logging operations, expanding logging operations will, will cost a million and a half dollars. So up here, again, same format, I want to put negative one and a half million dollars, and then look at what the returns are for each year. So 2016, it's 250,000. 2017, it's 300. 2018, 350. 400 in 2019, 400 in 2020, and 400. Now oh, that's the wrong, the wrong type of cell. There we go. Okay. Um, so then we have all our cash flows for the logging project and the initial investment. So we do the same thing equal IRR and we just select the top cell which is the initial investment and drag it down through the rest of the cost your cash flows and hit enter and it gives us 10% or 9.7% actually in this case so for this particular um, for these particular projects if, if, if uh, the council was just looking at so only considering returns, average rate of return on the investment, then they'd want to choose the fish processing facility, right? Because it averages 12.17%, whereas the expansion of logging only gets 9.7% uh, of return on that investment. So this is one of the things that IRR can be used for is to, to allow you to compare different types of projects with different initial investments and then different cash flows in the future, and it breaks it all down to an average annual rate of return, which is, from most uh, investors' point of view, that's the most important number they care about, because they want to know uh, if they're going to be investing money in this project, then what, on average, are they going to be earning for each dollar that they invest? And so this gives them that information. So, sir, yep. so I learned 37s and the cells. To get to that percent, you put in equals what? IRR. Oh, I see it now, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's the function, just like equal PMT or equal NPR. That's uh, the Excel function that we use for this. All right, any other questions about this one, internal rate of return? No? Okay. Well, we're gonna practice some more of these. Um, so if you can go to week number eight, I believe. Let's see here. Oh, whoops, let me fix something here. I published uh, week number eight earlier today and it kept some of my old assignments. So I just unpublished some. So if you see anything in week number eight that refers to test number two, ignore it. Um, it's from an old uh, quarter. So tonight, um, let's see here. There should be a link under resources for in-class TVM questions three. 
So if you want to open that up, it will have similar questions uh, to what we were working on uh, last week, uh, along with the last question is, is one of these IRR questions. So what I'd like you to do is to, once you've had this, uh, this opened up here, again, this is under week eight, in class time value of money exercises, I'm going to give um, I'm going to give folks about five minutes. We'll, we'll spend five minutes on each of these. That'll probably be pretty good. And we'll get us close to six o'clock, and we'll go through all four of these. Um, and when you're done, or when you've completed the calculation, just go ahead and private chat me that answer, and then I can uh, uh, give you feedback on. And then we'll go over the the uh, question after that too. So. So uh, you, you'll want to have your blank time value of money uh, spreadsheet open, your Excel spreadsheet, and then um, the in-class time value of money exercises from week eight there. So let's start on number one, which, and just to get you going, uh, number one says you invest $500 per month in your IRA for retirement. If you do this for 30 years and your IRA has an average annual rate of 6%, how much money will you have when you retire? And then the second part, uh, don't worry about, uh, yeah, uh, we'll do the second part. What if you simply invested $6,000 once per year? So just answer the first two there. The first one is for $500 per month. And the second question just ask, instead of $500 per month, what if you invested $6,000 per year? And we'll talk about the differences between those two also. So let's take five minutes and work on this one. We just opened up a blank Excel document. Uh, you can do it in a blank Excel document or you can do it in the blank TVM document. The, uh, the one that has the Excel functions already in it. That's on the in-class time value money calculations? Yeah, from week number eight. Oh, wait, that's in Word. Yeah, those are the questions in Word.
All right, anybody got one they want to shoot me? I've gotten one so far, but it wasn't correct. <clears throat> Uh, got one correct for the second part. Okay, so let me show you how I did this. <clears throat> okay, so this question was asking about $500 a month investment for 30 years um, at 6%. So that was the first question. So. The payment is the negative 500. That's what you're investing every month. Because you're investing every month, though, you need to convert your time periods from years to months. So instead of being 30 years, it's going to be 30 times 12, 360 months. So that's what you put here in your N per 360. And then the other thing you have to do is convert your annual interest rate of 6% into a monthly interest rate. And basically how you do that is just divide it by 12. So you can put in equal 6% divided by 12 and it will give you a monthly interest rate of 0.5%. So if you invested $500 a month for 30 years and you earned on average 6% a year, at the end of 30 years you'd have 502,257.52 cents for retirement. So that's the first part of that question. The second part was, what if you simply invested $6,000 once per year? That's the same amount that you'd be investing as the first one. You would just be doing it at one time as opposed to throughout the year. So you have to change that and the payment then becomes a negative 6,000, right? That's the payment. And because that's what you're doing once a year, all the other variables have to be in the yearly variables too. So your N per becomes years again. So you take that to 30 and your interest rate just becomes 6%, which is what they gave you. And after you put those three variables in, uh, if you invested 6,000 a year for 30 years at 6%, then you would have 474,349, which is about 26, $27,000 less than if you invested $500 a month with everything else remaining the same. So one of the questions I have, um, can anybody tell me why the amount is, is less if you invest it only once per year versus um, throughout the year? No ideas? So it's the compounding effect. It's uh, what happens when you compound something um, throughout the year versus just have, essentially if you're uh, investing $6,000 once a year, you're compounding it once a year. Whereas if you are investing uh, once every month, you're compounding it 12 times a year. And so you earn a little bit more and it goes to your principal. And so then your next time period, you earn a little bit more because of that extra principal. And in the end, it, you know, it adds up to, to $27,000 or so uh, difference. And it's probably easier to invest on a monthly basis anyways, um, just to be more disciplined than a yearly basis. So, so those are the two answers for 1A and B. 502257 for A, 474349 for B. And I will save this document with the answers uh, and post it to week eight too, so you can look at this uh, after class tonight if you want to. All right, let's shoot for number two. Uh, number two is about buying a home, a uh, home that is worth 200,000, and we're assuming no down payment here. You're buying it for 200,000. If the bank is willing to give you a 30-year loan at 4.25% interest, what would your monthly payment be? Remember, we're, we're asking for months here, so everything has to be converted into months. So let's just do the first part of that one.
Sir? Yep. I'm still trying to do number one. After I had the three cells entered under future value, do I put a comma in, then hit enter? No, no comma. Just hit enter after the last value you put in. It's giving me an astronomical number. Okay, your time periods might not be right. So you have to convert uh, either to months for the first part of the question or to years for the second. Well, I have been at 360. Yep, what is your interest rate? 6%. Divide that by, that's a yearly interest rate. You have to convert your interest rate into months. So divide it by 12. Oh. So I hit equals All right, we have one right answer so far. Two right answers. And three, oh good. All right, so four or five right answers for this one. So this is a, you're looking for a PMT, right? A payment here. And so the information that was given was a $200,000 house. And so when you're thinking about doing any of these uh, home loan uh, problems that are looking for a payment, the initial value of what you're buying or the house in this case is present value, but it's negative because you're getting a loan for that amount. So you're getting a $200,000 loan. It's actually what you owe. So that's a negative amount that you'll be paying down uh, throughout the next 30 years. So I put negative 200,000 in present value. Um, when you pay it off at the end of 30 years, uh, the balance will be zero. So future value is just zero. You don't have to put that in. Um, it is a 30 year loan at 4.25%. Uh, but again, we're looking for a monthly payment, so we have to convert the time period and the interest rate into a monthly. And so the time period is 360, 30 years times 12 months, and the interest rate is just 4.25% divided by 12, and that gives us a monthly interest rate of 0.35%. 
So after putting all those in and entering the, the payment uh, function, you get a monthly payment for this house of 983.88 for both principal and interest on that. Okay. The uh, second part of that question, uh, what if the interest rate were 5%? If you've got all this stuff in here, it's pretty easy. All you have to do is change the interest rate. So you can click on the interest rate cell and change it from 4.25% divided by 12 to just 5% divided by 12. Then it will update your payment amount also. And so if it was 5%, then you'd be paying 1073.64 uh, every month. All right. All right, let's move on to three. And three is about a bond. Apple is selling a five-year bond. We'll pay $5,000 in five years. And if you're looking for a return of at least 4% a year, what is the maximum you would be willing to pay today for this bond? So hint, this is a present value uh, question. And the second part of the question is what, you, what would you be willing to pay if the bond also paid an annual coupon of $50 for, actually, let's just do the first part. Second part is incorrect anyways. Got one right answer so far. Sir? Yep. Under rate, do we got to put in equals and then type the word rate or what? Uh, no, if it's just a variable, all you have to do is type in the number. It's only if you want to figure out what the rate is that you use the function. So the function we're looking for here is the present value function. I know, but I still we're going on number two, the first part. Oh. Yeah, I have to keep moving, David. Sorry. All right, I'll just shut up. No, you don't need to shut up. I just. Uh, I think we might need to work together in a, in a web session outside of class. So why don't we work on scheduling that? Okay. Okay. One, two, three. Correct one so far. 
three out of four. So for number three here, this uh, apple bond, <clears throat> let's see, where is it? Oh, here it is. So it's a bond that you're gonna, the rate is 4%. So, and everything here in this one is in, based on years. So you don't have to convert anything to months in this particular one. 4% you know, rate, five years, and $5,000 at the end of those five years. And so then the function that you use is equal PV and use those three variables. And you should come up with, you'd be willing to pay 4109.64 today for a bond that would pay you $5,000 in five years, which is the equivalent of making 4% uh, on your investment for the next five years. So 4109.64 is the answer for that one. All right, let's do the last one here and then we'll uh, take a break. The last number four here is uh, one of the internal rate of return uh, functions uh, that I talked about earlier tonight. So this has both logging and fish processing. Again, the numbers are different though. So um, the fish processing facility is three and a half million would be the investment required for that. The log expanding logging operations would cost 2.25 million. And then you have the uh, returns down here. So again, what you want to do is you want to create a table like this where you have the initial investment at the top and then all those returns at the bottom. Um, and if it's probably easier, this is what I do, um, as opposed to go back and forth between your documents to look at this, just, um, whoops, I guess you have to download it. If you put this into a Word, doc, if you load this into a Word document here, then you can just cut this picture out and put it in your Excel, like somewhere next to it. That way you have the numbers here and you can just enter the numbers. You can't paste it directly into Excel, but you can have it there so you can look at it and then you can enter all the numbers over here. So. So let's do number four and figure out basically the internal rate of return for both of these projects, the logging and the fish processing.
<clears throat> so they have two correct answers. Remember, all the calculations that you do uh, need to be to two decimal places. So. one. All right, this is how I set it up. Um, again, you want your initial investment to be on the top row, um, and that should always be entered as a negative, because it's money you're investing with the hope of getting money back. And then all your returns through the year, through the years, uh, are entered as positive numbers. So with a fish processing facility and a three and a half million dollar initial investment, these were the uh, cash flows. Uh, throughout the years after the investment. And the internal rate of return was 8.89% for the fish processing. Logging was uh, a $2.25 million initial investment. And there are the returns. And that one earned 9.07%. So just purely based on uh, uh, financial considerations, you'd wanna choose the logging operation somewhat in this case that has a slightly higher uh, rate of return than the fish processing investment. Okay. All right, so there are going to be, uh, there's one assignment, uh, time value money assignment for next week, so there'll be an opportunity for you to practice this a little bit more. Um, but as I said at the beginning, I've graded, I didn't grade the time value money assignment that was due tonight, uh, but I did, provide the examples of what we did last week and the answers to that. So you might want to go back and look at those things. Um, I have graded the last couple weeks of homework now. Um, and so I'd also encourage everyone to look at the feedback when they get a chance on that. Um, and if you have any questions based on that feedback, just let me know. So it's a little after six. Why don't we take our 10 minute break right now and then we're going to segue over to chapter six. And I guess I'll also just say that, uh, you know, if anybody wants to set up a, a time outside of class to have a Zoom session with me to work on, whether it's TVMs, time value money, stuff for financial calculations, just email me and we'll schedule a time to do that. Um, I'm, I should be pretty flexible this next week, so. All right, so let's take a 10 minute break here.
All right, so how about if we uh, work on this last, if I talk to you a little bit, I guess, about chapter six. Um, we're only gonna be covering a small part of uh, chapter six about interest rates. Really, I, I want you to understand the concepts uh, behind how they calculate interest rates and how interest rates are determined for things like home loans and car loans. Um, how credit scores play into that, how uh, the amount of time uh, of the loan plays into that. Um, so you can have an understanding basically of how banks and other financial institutions will set rates uh, for interest uh, for different types of loans. So I'm going to, uh, under week eight there, you can either bring this up in Canvas uh, there's a file called Chapter 6 Interest Rate Equations. I'm going to show this on my screen in a second. It's on page 189 of your book, uh, if you're using the 7th edition, which is the book for this class. But I'll bring it up here on my screen, too, so you can see it. And I'm really just going to go over the different components that go into creating a quoted interest rate. Um, because there are a number of different risk premiums involved to talk about. So I guess, first of all, I'll just say from a conceptual standpoint, the interest rate uh, you can really think of as the cost of money. It's uh, how much will it cost you to get a loan for a particular amount of money. The, the cost of that is not the money that you get because you're going to be paying that back. The cost is the actual interest rate that you're charged on that loan. And it's based on um, it's based on a number of these risk premiums, and that's what go into creating this quoted interest rate here. And so the uh, equation for uh, determining a quoted interest rate is, and the quoted interest rate here is just R. So that's how we designate the interest rate. Uh, you determine that by taking R star and I'm gonna go over what each of these mean in a second, plus IP, which stands for inflation premium, DRP, which stands for default risk premium, LP, which stands for liquidity premium, and MRP, which stands for maturity risk premium. So we're basically, you know, if we're gonna figure out a quoted interest rate, you'd wanna find all those things, add them up, and that's what your quoted interest rate would be at the end. I'm not gonna ask you to, uh, either tonight or on the test next week, to calculate um, a quoted interest rate, but I am gonna expect that you know um, what the risk premiums are uh, and, uh, and how they contribute to the quoted interest rate. So these definitions down here are pretty key to this whole thing. So I'm just gonna start from the left here and move to the right and talk about these five different risk premiums. Um, R star is essentially the uh, risk-free real rate of interest. Um, and this essentially would equate to 
if you found an investment that had no risk whatsoever of losing your money, what would the interest rate on that investment be? So it's a real low risk uh, investment. And in most cases, this is our star is, is the equivalent of a very, very short term US government bond. So say a one month bond or a three month bond, um, those can be used as the real risk free rate of interest. I think right now, um, a three month bond may be paying 0.36% or something of that nature. So if you were to, to buy a real short term US bond, and US bonds are seen as the safest in the world, so their risk level is the lowest, then what would they pay you for that? And I think right now it's about 0.35%. Um, can actually check that here. Um, let's see, US. There are several good sites to find U.S. government bond rates, and so uh, Bankrate is one of them. Bankrate actually we'll be using uh, here in a second too. So you can see Treasury securities, which essentially are U.S. government bonds. They go from a ten-year bond. Um, and it's down to, a, they only have down to a 90 day bond. So right now, if you were to buy a 90 day US government bond, it would pay you point, this week it would pay you 0.78%. Month ago, it was 0.54%. So interest rates are rising on bonds. But this could be, it would actually be more like a 30 day T-bill would be the equivalent of a, of a uh, risk-free real rate of interest. So that would be the first, um, whoops, get back to where my screen is here. That would be this first variable here, R star. Um, the second premium that you need to add in is, is called an inflation premium. And basically what this is, is it's what you expect, no one knows this because you would be predicting the future if you did, but based on the information that you have, what do you believe the average rate of inflation will be for the length of the loan that you're getting? So if it's a, let's say it's a five-year car loan, then the inflation premium in this calculation would be what the lender believes the average rate of inflation will be for the next five years, because that's the length of the loan. For a 30-year home loan, then they have to uh, do quite a bit more forecasting and, and estimate what they believe the average interest rate for the next 30 years will be. But if we think about this in the context of a car loan that has a five-year uh, loan maturity on it, we'd probably say the inflation premium, given what it's been for the last few years, will be around 2%, maybe, 2 to 3%. It seems to be increasing some. And so, the lender would put in a figure there for inflation premium of two to 3%. Um, and it's gonna add it to these other uh, risk premiums that we're, uh, we have here too. So that's the inflation premium, just the average expected rate of inflation for the length of the investment. DRP stands for default risk premium. And this one is, is pretty key um, because it really, uh, what the default risk premium is, is uh, it's asking the question, how likely is it that the person who is borrowing the money will not be able to pay it back? In other, in other words, they're going to default on the loan that they're given. Um, and so when you look at things like U.S. government bonds where there is no risk, there is no default risk premium for those, right? Because the U.S. government so far has always paid off the bonds that it has put out there. Um, so for those securities, the default risk premium is zero. But if you're thinking about it in the context of a loan, then they're looking at the person getting the loan, you, if you're buying the car. And so to assess your personal default risk premium, um, lending institutions, financial institutions will typically use your credit score as a major component of, it, of that. The higher your credit score, the less likely it is they believe that you're going to default on a loan. The lower your credit score, the more likely it is that you may be able to, that you may be defaulting on a loan. So 
basically, if you have a high credit score, your default risk premium is pretty low. They're not going to charge you additional, too much additional interest for that. But if your credit score is lower, then they're probably going to bump the interest rate a little bit just for the fact that you may be more likely to default on the loan than another uh, borrower with a higher credit rating. So, um, so that's default risk premium, DRP. The LP is liquidity premium. And as we know from our calculations of current ratio and quick ratio, liquidity is the ability to turn assets into money, into cash money, in a short period of time. The most liquid uh, asset that you can have is cash because it's already cash. You're not turning it into cash. But you could have other assets like accounts receivable or inventory or property, plant, and equipment that you could turn into cash, but it's gonna take you some time to do so. And so, depending on how easy it is for you to turn your investment into cash, um, your liquidity premium is going to be lower if it's really easy. It's gonna be higher uh, if, it's, if it's more difficult or takes more time to turn it into cash. So something like a, a home loan, for instance, would have a slightly higher level, uh, everything else being equal, of liquidity premium than say a car loan, simply because the process of turning a house into money, that whole sales process takes longer time than it would be if you just wanted to sell your car that you have a loan on, right? It's gonna be, that the, the time period to do those transactions is gonna be different. And so with, a, with an auto loan, liquidity premium compared to a home loan would be lower because you can turn into cash quicker. And for the home loan, it would be the opposite. It would be slightly higher because of that process. So that's LP here as a risk premium. Um, the last risk premium there is, is called a maturity risk premium, MRP. And what that measures is literally the length of time that the investment or the loan is out for. Um, because the longer a loan or an investment is out there, the more the, the, the increased likelihood that there's gonna be some swing in the value of it. Um, and so maturity risk premium is low for a, very, for a short term investment, say a one year bond. The maturity risk premium is gonna be a lot lower than it is for a five year bond, a 10 year bond, or a, certainly a 30 year bond. As you move out in the length of time of the investment or the loan increases, so will the maturity risk premium just because the world changes and, and, and uh, um, that potentially affects, that could affect the, the value of the underlying asset there. So that's a maturity um, risk premium. And so if we went through the research and found as a lender, um, or potentially, I mean, it would have to be a lender. Basically the lenders maintain these um, metrics that they measure, um, they measure the ability of people who want to borrow from them, how they fit into these particular risk premiums. And again, for, for most uh, people, if you're looking, you know, if, you, if you're looking for a loan for an auto or a home, the main thing that's going to change between borrowers is this default risk premium. And again, that's measured by people's credit scores. The higher the credit score, the better, um, the less you're going to pay for a premium. Um, everything else, for each investment will pretty much stay the same, but the default risk premium between borrowers will be what changes. Um, and one of the ways, hopefully, that we can see that here is if we go back to that bank rate site, one of the things, so this is a, uh, this bank rate is owned by, essentially it's, it's owned by the banking industry and it's a, it's a way for them to, it gives a bunch of great calculators you go up here to calculators and they will have calculators for calculating payments. This is some of the same stuff we're doing in Excel, but if you don't want to use Excel, you can go here and put in the information for an auto loan or a home loan or um, credit card to determine what payments are going to be, to determine how much interest you're going to pay. Um, they also have investment calculators and things like that. But one of the things they, they, one of the primary objectives of this site is to market and sell loans. 
And so if we go back to the main site here, um, what you can do is you can figure out what you would potentially be paying in interest uh, for a particular home loan in this case. So these loan rates here, excuse me, are for, are for home loans. And so I'm gonna put in my zip code here. We'll just see how this works. And then it's gonna ask you for some questions. Or it's gonna ask you some questions here. Location of the home, property value, loan balance, and then whether it's a 30-year loan, and finally, what your credit score is. And I'm gonna show you, hopefully, how some of these interest rates change based on your, based on a credit score. So I'm just gonna put in a property value, say of 200,000 here, and a loan balance, in other words, how much are you getting a loan for? Typically, for, for many homes, if you want a conventional home loan, you have to put down 20%. If you get an FHA, you can put down 3%. Let's say you're gonna put down $10,000, as a down payment. So your loan balance will be 190 is what you're gonna pay off. And we'll leave it at 30 year fixed um, and your credit score of 740 plus. So set, uh, credit scores go up to I believe 850. So anything higher than 740 is considered uh, very good credit. And so if we just go in here, we put these things in here, let's update the rates. All right, and so we have, with this information, we have, I want to organize it by rates, there we go. The lowest rate we can get on a 30-year mortgage is 4.123% based on the information that we put in over here. And it goes up, uh, obviously, other lenders charging more. Um, that's at 740 plus. Let's see what happens if we move it down, say, to 700 to 719. See if that changes any of these interest rates here. Uh, a little bit. It didn't change the first Cal Washington, but I believe Lending Home and Pacific went up slightly from that. And so this would essentially mean that they're adding more interest in there based on a default risk premium, based on you having slightly less good credit. If we move it all the way down to the bottom here, they only got to go down to 660. If we move it down to 660. Yeah, there we see. So the rate on the lowest loan went up about 0.125%, so about an eighth of a percent. And everything else went up quite a bit more. So now you see the second best option is 4.534. And if we go back to the 740, You can see you have a ton of rates here that are in the four ones, but as your credit gets worse, all of these rates are gonna go up just because they see you as a higher risk to default on their loan. So this is what you get when you're in the 660 to 680 range. They charge you more interest. And that's essentially what uh, banks and other lending institutions will do. They'll try to determine the risk level, both of the borrower and the loan that they're giving out, and the riskier it is, the more interest they're gonna charge you for that particular loan. Because when investors look at things, two primary considerations for them are risk, the level of risk, and the level of return. So if you have a really low risk investment, like a US Treasury bond, and it's a 90 day Treasury bond, it's only gonna pay you 0 0.78%. But people are still buying those because it's super safe, right? Your money is really not at risk at all in those investments. On the other hand, when you look at an investment that has a higher risk, so if you're buying bonds, that would be, you know, a good example would be, for instance, buying bonds from the government of Greece right now. There's a lot of potential for Greece actually to default on their bond payments and not be able to pay back the people who loan the money in the form of these bonds. And so Greece, I, I think Greek U.S. government bonds right now are paying 10 to 12 percent per year in return if, you're, if you loan them money, whereas 
for the same amount of time in the US, you would get about 2%, probably a little over 2% for a five to 10 year bond um, from the US. And that's simply because Greece has a much higher likelihood of defaulting because they have all sorts of uh, problems with their government budget. They have all sorts of problems with their economy. Um, and they have, I believe, they've defaulted on one set of, of government bonds already. And so they have to pay the investors a lot. Investors require a lot in return um, for an investment in a Greek bond, much more than they do in a U.S. bond, simply because the probability that Greece may default on those, on those bonds. And so you can look at it from that perspective, from the investor's perspective. But then if you turn around and you look at it from the person who's actually desiring money who wants a loan either a government who wants a loan in the form of bond or an individual who wants a loan for a car or a home or anything else for that matter then as they perceive the default risk of those um, borrowers increasing the interest rate should go up too because they want some return in exchange for them taking on that additional risk of uh, the borrower defaulting on the loan if the borrower has a really high credit rating and there's not as big of a chance that they're going to default, then the lender is going to be willing to accept a little less interest in exchange for that safe, uh, safe loan or safer loan to the individual. So any questions about uh, this or any of the, uh, this chapter six interest rate equation or how this works? No? Okay. So if you haven't read chapter six, read this section in chapter six. Um, and again, I really just want you to understand the definitions and the concepts behind these uh, variables here, these risk premiums, and what goes into figuring out a quoted interest rate for a particular product. So um, be able to talk about why, what the liquidity premium is and what it measures and a default risk premium and that sort of thing. Um, and you'll be good to go for information from chapter six. This is really the only information uh, out of chapter six I wanted to cover um, with you. Oh, there's actually one more thing I want to look at. Because we looked at, we were looking at the changes in credit score and how that affects default risk premium. But the other thing uh, that can change, especially with home loans, is maturity risk premium. And so if we go back to the same, go back to bank rate here, because you can get a home loan for 30 years, you can get a home loan for 20, for 15, for 10, obviously impacts your, the amount that you'll be paying every, uh, every month, but you can get all sorts of different maturities of home loans. And the longer the maturity, the greater the maturity uh, risk premium should be the MRP part of it should be let's see if it allows me oh good so we're gonna do a 30-year loan we'll do a 15-year loan and we'll do a 10-year loan product so this will last time we were just looking for 30-year loans this time we'll look for 10-year and 15-year loans just to see what the difference is and I'm not going to change the credit scores on these because all we want to look at or, or try to evaluate is what the difference in terms and how that affects um, these. So they're giving us 30 year fixed at the top. So right now, if I went with Pacific for a 30 year uh, loan, they'd give it to me for 4.114%. So if I go down, hopefully, yeah, there's a 15 year. So the 15 year from Pacific goes all the way down to 3.25%. It's the exact same person's exact same credit rating as the 30 year. And the only thing that's changed is the amount of time going from 15 years to 30 years. And so they're charging obviously a maturity risk premium, the difference between 3.25% and 4.114. So they're charging about 0.86% more for a 30 year. So their maturity risk premium is 0.86% higher. And all that is is based on the amount of time. There's more possibility for risk in 30 years than there is in 15 years. And so 15 is at 3.25. Let's see if there's any 10 years here. Yeah, see 10 years goes down even more. Um, Pacific doesn't have one here, but Third Federal 
If you have a 10-year fixed rate, it would only be 2.959%. So from a 15-year to a 10-year, uh, there's a decrease of about, let's see here, yeah, they were 3.25 also. So there is a decrease of about 0.125%, or excuse me, 0.25%, a little more than 0.25%, just based on the amount of time for that loan. So that's one of the ways that you can see how the maturity risk premium figures into these calculations is, is, the, is the length of time. I'm sorry? We can just wait for um, Trump to screw up again and then the interest rates will drop again. <laughs> Was that a comment for the class, Therese? Yeah. Yes, it was. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I'll try not to address the political part of that, but yeah, right now, actually, the Federal Reserve, which is the bank of the U.S. government, uh, based on um, low unemployment and uh, increased stock market values, they're looking at potentially increasing the amount that they charge banks to give loans out um, strictly as a way to try to keep inflation in check because one of the things that can happen is if you keep interest rates low for an extended period of time and you give a lot of people this access to this credit then you have a lot of people wanting to buy goods whether it's houses or cars or whatever and as that happens it slowly drives the price of those things up like in the real estate market right now, the, um, the interest rates have been uh, at historic lows, like literally the lowest they've been in the existence of the 40 to 50 year um, federally guaranteed loan programs that there are right now. 4% is, is pretty much unheard of, um, but they've kept it that way with the government's help to try to um, really support the real estate market because if interest rates start to go up for real estate then that's going to have a cooling effect on the market and those prices aren't going to you know prices in real estate have been going up and up again just as they did in the mid 2000s and there's some concern that there might be a bubble out there right now just because of these really low interest rates um, and the longer those low interest rates stay out there the more pressure it puts on those values to go up and so they don't necessarily see this appreciation, this increase in real estate values as sustainable. And once they, the interest rates start creeping up because 99.9% .9 of the people buying houses need a loan to buy the house, then that's gonna have an a, have a impact, a negative impact on the value of real estate. It might just slow the increase down. It might cause it to plateau out. I'm, I'm hoping, guessing, that it's not going to cause real estate values to actually fall. Um, but they do want to get a handle on that because if you have inflation increasing for cars and, and homes and food and everything else, then it just means it takes more money to buy those same things. And they don't want to get into a, a, a essentially a vicious cycle of things increasing substantially every year. The goal of the, the Federal Reserve really is to keep the inflation rate between 1% and 2%. They consider that a reasonable rate of growth uh, for the economy and for assets like houses and things like that. So, anyways, um, if you're looking for a home loan, bank rate is probably a good place to go, not necessarily to get the home loan itself, but just to see what different um, banks and other uh, lenders are offering for interest rates. Just as a good, good way to give yourself a baseline uh, for that. And as I said, they also have a number of good um, calculators that you can use for, for retirement purposes to calculate, you know. And these are, again, these are things that we've done in Excel uh, in these functions, but you can answer questions like, how much do I need to retire? Um, how, how long will it take to pay off a credit card balance that carries a certain interest rate? Um, things like that. So there are a number of good calculators uh, on this bank rate site. I'd encourage you to check it out. Okay, uh, any questions about uh, interest rates? Anything I've covered on interest rates tonight? No? Okay, well, that was all the information I wanted to cover tonight. And so for next week, 
few things. Uh, if you go out to week number eight in Canvas, there is there are some assignments. And there's some extra credit assignments. So I wanted to go over those uh, real briefly. I also wanted to say, just mention this one more time, there were a number of people who didn't submit a test number one. And so I sent you all an email out this afternoon about that. So you'll have one more opportunity to submit a, a different test um, uh, tomorrow. And so what I'll do is I'm gonna, for the people who didn't submit a test last week, um, I will email out this new version of the test tomorrow afternoon, and then you'll have until the following day, Thursday at five um, to complete that. So for those who didn't take the test, look for that. Um, the course evaluation, so this is uh, uh, just the NWIC course evaluation. I always like to encourage students, whether they get extra credit or not, for this to do this, just because it's a great way to give both myself and the college feedback on how these courses are working for you. It's completely anonymous. We, don't, uh, we see the information um, anonymously after grades are posted, so if you have any fear or uh, sense that it may be used uh, or might impact your grade, it will have no impact whatsoever. Um, really, it's just a way for us to get good information on what's working and what's not working in our classes. So if you want extra credit, you can um, follow the instructions in this login, uh, evaluation login document, and it'll take you there. Um, there's one more uh, time value money calculation exercise for next week and it's under assignments, TDM four questions. Um, so that will be uh, an assignment. There's, extra, there's another extra credit assignment if you want to do a little bit more work on the financial calculations and earn extra credit. I included, um, yeah, I included uh, some Microsoft financial statements. And so if you want to work through uh, the 10, financial calculations from chapter four. Um, I'll give you extra credit, basically the amount of an assignment for extra credit for that also. And I really encourage you to definitely do both of these, uh, time value of money calcs for, and the extra credit for the financial calculations, just because those are gonna be two primary things that are on the in-class portion of the test next week. So it's just another opportunity for you to practice. Um, and as you submit, I'd, I'd say as you're working on these, submit them as you complete them because I'm going to be trying to grade everything as it comes in over the next three to four days so that you can have some good feedback before the test on Tuesday. Um, and again, if there are things that you need to work through that you feel like you need an individual Zoom session with me, just email me and let me know and we can, we'll, we'll schedule something. That's not a problem. Um, any other late assignments from weeks uh, five through seven? So previous weeks, just five through seven, um, you can turn in by Tuesday at 5 p.m. also for credit. Uh, and yeah, and then as I said, next Tuesday, the first hour of class, um, I'll be covering some good information for you to know from chapter eight. And then the last hour will just be um, the in-class portion of the test. There will be an essay uh, portion of the take-home essay portion of the test uh, that I'll distribute next week during class that you'll have a day to complete uh, also, and then you'll be finished. So. so that's what we have for the last week of the quarter. Any questions about any of those assignments or other items? I do. On a week eight assignments, mm -hmm. I, I can't see the print because it's too small. But you have the ones that are, do you have them marked the ones that we're going to post to turn it and the ones that are just extra credit? The ones that are extra credit are labeled extra credit. That's the first thing in those assignments. So, yeah. So yeah. We, should, we should consider all the other ones we have to turn in. Yeah, there's, there's, there are two extra credits and there's only one regular assignment. It's a time value money four. So that's the only, for week number eight, that's the only regular assignment. And David, just email me. Uh, we can set up a time to have a Zoom session. If you want. Definitely will. Okay. All right. Anybody else? It's a little early tonight. 
All right. Well, if no other questions, uh, as I said, work on those assignments this week. If you have questions you go through, email me and, uh, and I'll just plan on seeing you next Tuesday for the last day of class and spring break. All right, have a good week.